So uh, we are now uh, at the last agenda item, which is the panel X-ray extended meta universe. So we will have Steve Mann uh, as our moderator, who is recognized as the father of wearable computing. Uh, we have myself and uh, Tom Furness, who is recognized as the grandfather of virtual reality, and uh, Joseph uh, Paradeso, uh, who is uh, Alexander uh, Trifus Professor and uh, also associ Associate Academic Head of Programming Media Arts and Sciences at uh, MIT Media Lab. And uh, lastly, Tom Coughlin, our uh, 2023 IEEE President-elect and uh, 2024 IEEE President. So, Steve, uh, I, I will leave it to you to to uh, leave, uh, well, lead us uh, for this panel. Excellent. So, uh, uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. And uh, so, uh, my technical team was not able to get WebEx to work with any of the computers I have in my lab. So I've cobbled together a piece of hardware that air gaps my computer. So I don't know, if, tell me if you can see my screen okay. Yes, I, we can see your screen. Okay, so uh, I wanna talk about the the uh, extensions to the metaverse, I guess. I'll just I'll just go F11 here and go full screen. Um, and Yu Yuan and I have been working on this for some years now, I guess, just generalization. And uh, you know, XV is the extended verse or extended metaverse, extended meta universe. There's all these verses like you know, hollow verse, omniverse, and metaverse, mm -hmm. extended universe, extended multiverse, and so on. So we're kind of putting them all under XV, where X is this variable that represents all of them. And um, firstly, just a little bit about myself. I guess I've been living for 48 years uh, since childhood in the 1970s. Uh, in this sort of computer generated world uh, on top of reality, what we call XR, extended reality. And and uh, uh, it, it comes, if you look at, at, you've got physical reality and virtual reality, and and, and, and since my screen share is not working, I'm gonna just show it really. Um, uh, PR is, the P is the physical reality and V is the virtual reality. And we can think of them on, 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 on a pair of axes, kind of like, you know, say bits and atoms alpha atoms, beta bits, and, you know, physical is out here on the reality axis and virtuality axis, and we've got to sort of see this here. And then now um, we, we have uh, augmented reality comes along, and, uh, you know, I've got the Meta 2 uh, eyeglass here, uh, for example, that's an example of an augmented reality eyeglass, and the, and the Meta Pro over there is another example of an augmented reality eyeglass. And so that uh, has some bits and some atoms to it. You know, there's a, a kind of combination of bits and atoms. This is the meta one, the original meta. And um, this augmented reality, now we can fit flesh out in that space. And if, you can see it divides into octants. I mean, there's sort of four logical octants. You can, you can see it, uh, quadrants. I mean, it, it divides into these four quadrants, the space. And so we've got something here, we've got something here, we've got something here, and there's missing, there's something missing from here. When you look at it in this bit, the atoms taxonomy. And the thing that's missing is we'll call that diminished reality. Technologies that deliberately diminish reality, technologies like sunglasses and baseball caps and earplugs and things like that, deliberately cut down reality, DR. And the quintessential example of DR is the float tank, the isolation tank. So this is the four quadrants uh, uh, here. Ice water swimming is, you know, one example. And so, so this is a float tank VR. Now we can, if we go inside a float tank with with a, with a VR headset, you can you can kind of get this idea here that that we're in this reality that's modulated or uh, um, uh, you only have virtually you've cut out all the external input. And so now we've got these four quadrants. And what XR, what we said with XR is let's extend beyond these. Let's extend human perception beyond these, but also let X be a general variable that can represent all four of these. And so we got, uh, you know, all four of these different realities here. And what I can do is I can just get rid of them all and have only one of them. And I don't have to, I, it, it simplifies life because I just I just have this one thing. And so uh, moreover, X, X means extension beyond what the realities are. Uh, here we have ice water swimming as a quintessential example of reality. 
um, and we've got the VR float tank as a quintessential example of virtuality. And but now we can try to go past 100% uh, and increase our perception. Uh, and I want to talk more about that later because we're kind of talking mainly about physics and math here. So uh, my own work uh, for the last since childhood, one of my childhood hobbies was photographing and seeing and making visible electromagnetic radio waves, uh, seeing metavision, which is the vision of vision sensing sensors and sensing their capacity to sense cameras, that sort of thing. And so many of these things here are extensions trying to see more beyond what the human can see, see in the infrared, see in the ultraviolet. This is, I'm, I'm seeing radar waves here. Uh, this is an example of seeing uh, actually, the radar away from seeing Internet of Things, uh, hand wash faucets, we can see them now as, as they see, and sensing automobiles of practical use, self driving cars, we can look at and visualize, see, and photograph the sensory capacity of the car to know that it's in good working order. Um, and this is a drone swarm, you know, so I'm swimming it out and various things like that. These are all extended realities. And this is a motor with a row of 100 green LEDs attached to it so that it traces out its magnetic field inside the motor. And then there's RGB here. And so this is, these are examples of extended reality. This is a, my bicycle and I've got a bunch of LEDs on there that show the powertrain, powertrainography, the, the internal motor magnetic fields and their effects on the powertrain. And so these are all examples of extended reality, there's two microphones in their capacity to listen. And of course, we can see the interference pattern that this capacity to listen has. We can see it, we can photograph it. And so that's an example of XR. And there's a simple definition of XR, which you can look up in, on, online. I want to move right along to XV, though, because collaborative or shared XR is what you, Yuan, and I are talking about and calling XV, the extendiverse. Um, uh, and, and this is my office at Meta, and this is an example of, of collaboration in, in XR. And so we provided a definition of XV, which you can look up. And broadly speaking, it's a shared XR intelligent environment, and then we come up with this definition. And so one way to think about it is, is, is to think about it in terms of, 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 of spatialization. Like, like, you know, you've got these realities. The metaverse is kind of a shared virtual reality. It's coming out of the page, if you will. Bits and atoms are here, uh, reality and virtuality, and then the metaverse comes out of the page. And the extendiverse is, is a shared XR. XR goes beyond, and then, and then uh, uh, XV is the shared, uh, where this third axis here coming out of the page is sociality. Uh, it's kind of the social or, or uh, Gamma is the Greek letter we use for genes, it's a small unit of human, humanness. And so that's our, our, our third axis. And uh, so we can take that as, a, as a, the extend of versus this, this, this extra axis. Uh, and it gives us grand challenges. Uh, five of these grand challenges I, I'm listing right now, uh, we, we, we've identified five challenges. One is standards. There needs to be standards like, how come I can't use WebEx? Well, it's not a standard, whereas Jitsi is standards-based. We need the same thing for uh, the metaverse. We don't want the metaverse looking like WebEx. We want it looking like Jitsi. Uh, so how can we make standards? How can we, how can we build standards so that everything's standards-based? You know, RTMP, RTSP is the standards for video conferencing. Uh, the standards for JPEG, the standards for two-dimensional stuff. How do we make standards for the extendiverse? And so. Uh, as we go down this list, I want I want you Yuan to speak to standards. Um, I've kind of mapped out this little uh, thing here. Standards, uh, and then the second uh, challenge is human factors and perception. Uh, this taxonomy is only addressing the physics of the situation, not addressing the perception. And perception is another element that wraps around all of these. And I want kind of Tom Furness to speak to perception and human factors. And then reliability, Joe, uh, uh, we brought in Joe because he's kind of a boots on the ground. He builds things, understands things. And so how do we make this thing reliable? How do we make this technology actually work? Why is it that every time we have a video conferencing, we have a series of technical glitches? They're only going to get worse when we bring it into 3D. How can we make it better and not worse? Uh, as the IEEE tech slogan is, advancing technology for humanity. And uh, I want Thomas to speak to the storage issues, like surveillance is lifelong capture of your whole life. I've been kind of doing lifelong capture of all kinds of things like respiration, heart, ECG, what's inside my head, what's around me as I go through my day-to-day -day life. 
So I, I'll just briefly touch on this fifth one, ethics, and then I, I, I'd like each of the the, the other panelists, uh, each of the panelists, to to talk about um, about these four things. So uh, if we take that that model, alpha, beta, gamma, bits, atoms, genes, and we take one over each of those, or if we take s of the scale of those, just the scale. Let's look at the scale of this. Instead of the amount of reality and the amount of virtuality and the amount of sociality, let's look at the scale of physicality and the scale of virtuality and the scale of sociality. At the very small scales, uh, we've got <clears throat> sort of atoms, and then you've got wearables, and then you've got underwearables, and then you've got outerwear, and then you've got bicycles, and then you've got cars and streets buildings and streets and then you've got cities and then you've got uh you know provinces or states and then you've got countries and finally you've got world the whole world and the whole universe and we can say that there's a, a clear demarcation between technologies that are part of us and technologies that are around us and um and so let's say that we have technologies that are part of us we call that the environment and technologies that are around us we call that the environment Likewise, on the social axis, you've got individual, and then you get teams and groups and larger and larger organizations. So you've got, uh, and if you look at this in terms of a taxonomy, um, if we reverse these and take one over the scale, we've got body. How wearable is the technology? <clears throat> um, when it's really far, the, the, the stuff at the edge of the universe goes to the origin, infinity maps to zero, and we've got one over S, of alpha atoms, <clears throat> that's body, and then we've got control as one over S of theta, and one over S of gamma is ownership. So BOC, body ownership and control, are the axes. And I just I want to think about this as a taxonomy for these XV technologies because we can say uh, this is just a little model here uh, that that has um, the body along this axis. A control, whether you control it or someone else controls it, and ownership, do you own it, does somebody else own it? And ordinarily, technologies, if I walk down the street, uh, normally I am choose what I wear. I choose my own clothing, but I don't choose the building. This, uh, but That bank over there, I don't own it, I don't control it, I got no say over it, but I can choose my own clothes, I can choose my own smart eyeglasses and my own VR headset, and I choose what I wear and I own what I wear, but I don't. Now the counter examples to that are technologies like handcuffs, uh, which are wearable, they're of the body, but you might not control them, you're not in control. So these are the off axis. And so when we build technologies for humanity and the ethical considerations, this taxonomy, BOC taxonomy will help us understand that. So just as an example, uh, there's a famous joke, beam up my clothes, Scotty, that wasn't very funny. Uh, that's a very deeply philosophical thing because it helps us understand whether it's part of us or part of the environment. We expect our clothes to go with us in space time travel and science fiction. Uh, or the car analogy or the boat analogy. You know, two boats collide in the marina and one of the captains yells, hey, you hit me. And it's not like your boat hit my boat or your car hit my car. It's like you hit me. We think of that as part of ourselves. So that's environment versus environment. And this is a really good example of that clear demarcation here. That um, you know, you have the inside and the outside and the environment versus the environment. And so, uh, and we like to think of the environment as part, of the, the boundary between these two as part of the environment, part of us. Clothing we think of as part of us, not part of the environment. So this diagram here, this map captures that essence. And that's really where the ethical grounding is. Uh, so as far as the other uh, four grand challenges are, um, you could you speak to standards for XV and your take on XV? Could you give us a, a kind of um, please give us kind of uh, fill the group in on the stuff that you and I have been working on for many years now? Yeah, of course. So uh, thank you so much for the uh, wonderful introduction. So let me uh, speak about the uh, standards. Uh, so first of all, I think uh, like Steve pointed out. Uh, today we had uh, uh, well, several technical issues, and uh, those could, uh, well, we should do something to prevent that, such kind of things happening in the future metaverse, which is exactly uh, a trend that I uh, have been observing uh, in the recent years. So previously, uh, we kept talk about, talking about uh, 
the so-called market-driven standards, which means typically uh, we started the standards development after the technologies and uh, um, products uh, were mature enough. So people will say, okay, there, there are uh, some like uh, conflicting uh, products or uh, services in the market. We need to do something to to harmonize them. Uh, that's how uh, they uh, figure out they need to develop standards. But uh, uh, in the recent years, uh, in more and more cases, uh, people will feel that the standards need to be uh, involved earlier than, uh, than that later. The earlier, the better. So we start uh, keeping standards in mind from the very beginning, uh, and uh, uh, standards could even be developed before the um, technologies and the markets are uh, become mature. So we call that market driven stand market driving standards, uh, which means standards can play a leading role uh, in in the industry in some especially in the emerging technology areas, so such as the metaverse. So I would expect that, uh, you know, cause metaverse, metaverse is a super cross disciplinary topic. It's a, a super cross industry uh, area. So if we uh, do not uh, keep standards in mind or start developing standards, designing the framework, the overarching framework of standards from the very beginning, uh, we will be uh, having lots of, I would say waste in terms of the efforts and the time and the money we Put in the uh, put in the industry, so that's exactly why uh, uh, I have been working with uh, other people like uh, our our panelists uh, today and uh, our IEEE um, people to try to uh, use standardization as a as a uh, I would say a, a tool to help uh, pave the road uh, to wow, the. Wow, I love that. Members. That is so fantastic. That is great. Market. I like the way you've got market driven versus market driving. Like if we just zoom in on on N versus ing, it's just so uh, succinct and and wonderful. Thank you. I'll stop here and give you to it. Beautiful. So Tom, um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the human factors and how they wrap around these three axes, alpha, beta, gamma? Uh, you know, the reality, virtuality, and sociality, or S of alpha, S of beta, and S of gamma, or one over at, at those three. Actually, um, yeah, uh, thank you, Steve. In fact, uh, uh, it was an interesting discussion we had the other day, because I was thinking of this as, as uh, you know, strictly as like a mathematical formalism, but I think the, the useful point on all three of these axes, uh, bits, atoms, and social, that the zero point is the individual. And so, in all cases, you're going from what is identified for you in, in physical reality to the outside going on that axis um, to what is uh, you, your bits, if you will, or where you are um, versus information that relates to, to what is outside. And then the other one is uh, you as an individual versus you versus your interaction with others. So, I thought that was a really interesting insight of that. It changed the way I, I looked at uh, that the analogy you've made here. So I thought that was very insightful. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so it's sort of the individual, like like if we think of the individual person uh, as this as this You're the, core. It's, it's the origin, the origin point. It's the origin, yeah. yeah. That's kind of one way of thinking of it is that is that we are at the origin of our own world and then these axes extend outwards, like, like it's a, this first person perspective. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes sense, you know. It's like you're inside my head, looking out at the world, or something like that. Yeah, I thought I thought I thought it gave a good, uh, an interesting uh, view of the thing because the thing the thing that we all um, presumably know is is ourselves, or at least we want to understand ourselves. So we're, uh, you know, and everything else has an impact upon us. Of course, inside of us, there's impacts, but there's things that come from outside, and they can be represented, you know, by the physical world and its impact on us, um, uh, the the world of data, the world of information, um, and its impact on us, and then the world of other people, and uh, and all those things. In fact, and I think this is where this bottle kind of gets interesting. Is that you know it's basically a, um, if you deal with this as a you know I can draw vectors within this these three axes, is that uh, presumably uh, you could say if if I have this space, 
um, what is the interaction of all these three things on myself or uh, on people like me who might be other origins. In other words, we're each, each of us in a sense has our own origins. We each would have this, these three axes around us. Um, and then uh, we're interacting, um, you know, between these things. And that's kind of like these vector relationships. So, uh, you know, at least it's some, you know, it's all analogies, you know, how far it goes, you know, I don't know, but it's a, but it's an interesting way of thinking about it, I think. I really like the way you think about that. Like certainly know thyself is one thing. Indeed. And, and also the, the notion of roving vectors, you know, of, of, of roving, like we have these vectors that intersect with one another and, in some ways, we can think of each of us as a set of, uh, as an origin, as an origin point that's moving through space. There was another thing it brought up, you know, since we're using a bunch of meta terms, right? Uh, metaphysics. Um, it, it, <laughs> I, I see that in a sense of, as a play on words, right? Because metaphysics is a branch of philosophy. It deals with first principles, abstract concepts, being, knowing, substance, cause, identity, time, and space. I'm reading that off the definition, right? And I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, Ideally, and this is why I think human beings create technology for the most part is is uh, we're driven by a need to understand ourselves in the outside world. And certainly that's true of people who are engineers and scientists and stuff. And the thing yeah. about this, this XV approach, I think, is it may give us ways to make um, substantive to actually substantiate things which might otherwise be abstract concepts. You know, and maybe find new ways of understanding ourselves in the world around us. Uh, you know, whether it be on the social level, be on uh, the uh, reality or on on, on uh, the data level. And examples of that, I, I think of directly, for instance, if I'm doing modeling of something and I'm using uh, some virtual reality to try to understand the model or visualize, say, um, organic molecules by looking around them and essentially rotating them and playing with them, you know, uh, things like that, that we might be able to do that create new ways for us to understand the world around us. and it, and Potentially, even if you can then actuate those things, maybe connect that up to uh, 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 a simulate uh, simulations and or actually a construction of stuff and being able to make new new ways, uh, new things that never existed before, or new ways in which we can communicate or, uh, you know, and essentially, can we substantiate things that sometimes have been seen as being more metaphysical and make them something that is uh, closer to us being able to communicate better? Wow, that's that's really well put. Uh, I'm I, I'm all, I'm sort of the, the word metaphysics is kind of overused or soft used. It might soften our argument because I'm thinking the physics of physics. If I think literally what it means. Yeah, you, but, you'd like to get uh, self-referential stuff, and I think that's that is very interesting. And of course, um, you know that's the whole thing about uh, I I think therefore I am right. Uh, since yeah. I can refer to myself, I exist, right? So yeah, yeah. self-referential and mm -hmm. and. Uh, so now, uh, uh, to put another spin on this, um, uh, Joe, you do a lot of stuff with wearables. Uh, you've certain dabbled, you've played a lot in the wearables universe. Um, uh, the the thing, one of the big issues with all of this technology is getting it to be reliable. Where reliability is important, like automobiles, um, uh, if they were built like computers, imagine you know to to put on the brakes, you'd have to select the braking menu, you'd have one control wheel that controls the brakes and, and the steering and everything else and the volume on the radio and you'd select that menu and roll it over to this. So we've kind of, software is garbage for the most part. And because software is garbage and because our world is driven by software, we've gotten used to garbage. Like when I grew up, uh, I was used to things like, like this cathode ray oscillograph that works reliably, you know, like it's 100% reliable, it's still working after 80 years. And my Apple II computer over here uh, from 1978 still boots instantly. And so I grew up in an era when things worked. And I'm really frustrated now in the era that doesn't work. And I almost want to start a little Amish community that lives in the 1970s because I really can't stand garbage or crap, craplications and stuff like that. And things just don't work anymore. And we're starting to see that in automobiles, that people are getting used to the idea that things don't work. People are getting used to unreliability as the norm because they've grown up in the smartphone era where smartphones are full of crapplications. So how, uh, uh, Joe, if you could maybe speak to the importance, like how do we build technologies, uh, the Extendiverse, how do we make XV reliable and, and 
like how do we make it work? What are the technical challenges really for XV? The hardware glasses, how do you make these glasses physically work? And you know how to build things and you've done a lot of making. Maybe just maybe you could give us a little riff on that. Uh, sure, Steve. I wasn't really ready to talk about reliability. I'll say a little bit, and then I might generalize to a couple of other points while I'm here. I have to run. Oh, yeah, around. sure, sure. Feel free to play some jazz and bounce yeah, around. I'll, I'll definitely do that, but I got to run also to teach a class in the real physical world shortly after three. So I'll make my <laughs> point. Yeah. Be a moose. Um, but anyway, yeah, you made a great point. And, and as you know, Steve, some of you out there, if you know me, would know this too. Uh, Steve has been doing wearable computers for ages. I've been building synthesizers for ages. I've got the world's biggest homemade modular synthesizer, probably still, it's hard to say now, in my basement studio, still works. And I can get new modules, new URAC modules, because it's come back. I don't have to excuse this stuff anymore. The one volt per octave, five volt trigger standard is universal. I can plug anything in and it will work. It, with my software synthesizer, that's not necessarily so true. MIDI cables are getting obsolete. Um, anything that relied on any kind of a protocol uh, is starting to you know, be hard to interoperate or use at all if it, if it relies on anything else or relies on you want to run it on a different system. I think we may have a future where our old systems will live in the bowels of the new ones. I mean, for a while, Windows had to do that. That's why it was so kludgy because it had to support its legacy. Uh, this may be easier to do with smarter systems where uh, they uh, you know, can kind of run emulations of what they were before more gracefully. So maybe the stuff can can be interpreted going forward and still work to some extent. I don't know. Or we find better things to do. We don't need the old stuff. I like to be an optimist. Oh, I I have plenty of old stuff. Well, Joe, I'll give you a simple, uh, not just old, but for music synthesizers, I've got I've, I discovered something really remarkable. Is the quality varies inversely with the price. I had a Korg Oasis, which mm -hmm. is a ten thousand dollar machine, and it was absolute crap, super unreliable. But I've also got a Yamaha PSRE three hundred three, which was about a hundred bucks. And it's so much better, so much more reliable. It's just given me great satisfaction. All of these high-end synthesizers, because they're so full of software, they're absolute crap. Like this thing, I can't stand it. I can't actually use it. I want to smash it with a hammer. It bothers me so much because it just doesn't work ever. You know, it's got software in it. I think you're seeing something that's the risk of, of AR, VR too, is that if you get an expensive high-end synthesizer, for example, you're at the cutting edge. So the system is really run up to its capacity to some extent. It's not been fully tested or debugged. The software could also be kludgy. And if you get a high-end VR system, you're also spending a lot of money because something's going to be obsolete in a year or two. So people tend to stay two years behind the curve where it's safe, you have performance, you're not quite at the edge of what you can do now. But, you know, in a sense, it may be more usable in the longer run. So I think you see that in musical instruments too. The old Synclaviers were great. Uh, they lasted probably four or five years. And then they were blown away by the cheap things because Moore's Law kept advancing and, and putting things out of business that were formerly high end. And you're seeing something similar here. I don't know if Moore's Law is the culprit, but definitely advances in the technology or the culprit. Um, maybe uh, yeah, I got these. We got these underwater musical instruments, 30 or 40 years old, that still work beautifully. You know, it's, it's yeah, really the technical instrument will always work because it doesn't rely on infrastructure. Although it can wear out, <laughs> other things can happen that don't happen to the electrons as easily. Right? It depends on what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe I'll make a few general points and then I probably have to run, but, uh, I really resonate with what you talk about. We talked a bit yesterday. You and I have been having this conversation for what? 20 years now anyway. Uh, yeah. and I think people tend to think of, of, um, uh, these multiverses is, is connecting, uh, to virtual worlds, to games, things like that. That's the popular vernacular. I think most of us, at least here also look at it is enhancing connection to the real world. I think that's so important. A lot of the work that I've done the last years in this space has been exactly about that. We've been doing digital twins for our building, for landscapes full of sensors that we've done ourselves for about 15 years now. If, there's no time to show anything, but if you look for Doppel Lab, uh, Joe Paradiso Doppel Lab, or you look at uh, uh, Doppel Marsh or Tidmarsh, tidmarsh.media.mit.edu, you can see and maybe even experience some of this where we have data flowing from the natural world with lots of sensors and manifesting in a virtual space. And this, to me, the big picture here is that the whole notion, notion of presence is changing. You talk about what's close, what's far away. I don't know if I'm plugging into sensors everywhere exactly where I am. I can start to blur that line of presence. That's one of the beauties of this technology. And uh, we've seen that quite a, quite a bit. The other thing we like is scalable presence, right? So it's not just a headset. 
uh, this world is going to pull and push on you in many different ways, depending on the context, right? It can be my watch buzzing because somebody's at my front door. I can be immersed in the screen. I can have a, a set of goggles on and headphones or just earphones. It should be scalable. I call it scalable presence. So however we build these standards, there should be a way to scale it, project it down to different devices, just the way now web screens more or less are projected into different frameworks automatically. So something like that. And even representing, representing, representing people, right? There are humans, there are agents, that's your social, social axes. Not all of them are gonna be human, uh, but how do you represent them depending on their degree of immersion, right? So it may change. How is that gonna happen? Uh, I think in a way what we need is a tough deferred dynamic data. We don't have it. If we do scientific visualization, we all send our students to look at Tufty, right? The classic textbook. Is there something like that we can talk about now for dynamic data of the kind we have in these, these uh, multiverses? Uh, and then finally, we talked a lot about self, right? Uh, self is the center. I'm not so sure as well about that one because that's changing. I see the kids I'm gonna be lecturing now, the current PhD students in the media lab, they're all connected at a level we never were. At one level, they expect customization because they're in a world where everything is customized, but they all chat, they all talk, they all share things. It's almost an approach to a group mind. So the whole definition of self because of these technologies is, is also changing. So it's a dynamic world. On the, other hand, uh, on, on the other hand, Joel, I beg to differ with that because we live in the stealthy generation now. Self is more important than it ever was. When I was growing up, it was considered egotistical or, or selfish or self-centered to sort of focus on the self. But now people spend so much time fixing up themselves, it's making true. themselves beautiful. But it's uh, self, self may be Steve Mann putting on a wearable because that's what he does, right? For them, it's how the public perceives their self. It's Absolutely, not self but that's so self-centered that uh, we've never seen a more self-centered generation in human history. Yeah, but the way they evaluate it is their peers. I mean, it's 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 complicated. And I think the whole idea of where is the individual is changing. And you talk about extended intelligence, another thing you and I have talked about that we both dealt with a bit. Uh, and you're living a bit in that world yourself. All this information will be precognitively interpreted by sensors you wear, sensors the environment and presented to you before you even see text or, or hear words, right? Yeah, uh, it's yeah. the future interface. So what is self then? I'm in the cloud, I'm here. And it's kind of blurred. But, but I think it's more important than ever because now we really got to think about the boundary between the self and what's around us and how yeah. that interplays. Like I, the totally. Irving Kaufman presentation of self in everyday life is a must read now more than it ever has been. Totally agree with all of that. Uh, you know, there, there's a, a paradise on one end and, and there's a, there's a utopia on the other. Yeah, we got to balance it. Anyway, I got to go to run my class, but it's so such okay, a well, thank you so much for classes. participating. It's been wonderful connecting, and we'll follow up with some more writing and such. It's always great. Bye bye. Okay, so uh, moving right along, I wanna I wanna finally uh, talk about maybe the most important uh, aspect of all of this is. It, it, surveillance, uh, uh, what we call surveillance or life glogging or glogging, cyborg logging. Uh, you know, we talked about, you know, we often talk about web log or just log for short when we talk about cyborg log or glog for short uh, or just, just surveillance, you know, like self capture uh, creates a huge amount of data. And data storage is like the premium number one. Um, technical challenge probably to record my whole life as video, for example, so that I can go back and understand if I have a heart issue, I can go back and see what was in the environment that might have caused it. Uh, like a dash cam on a car is one thing, but imagine that for people and imagine everybody has that. How much data is that producing? And, and uh, Thomas, if you could speak to this issue of data in the context of lifelong reality capture, because right now I'm wearing about a dozen cameras and some LIDAR sets and, and, and things that capture 3D information about what's around me and builds an environment map of everywhere I go. Uh, how can we store that and deal with the storage? It's going to be some cloud-based, but it's going to be buffered or cached locally, and we probably want a local cache so that it builds an environment map. So if I go back to the same place, it can help me see, help me navigate. When I swim, there's rocks in the water, and I want to remember where they all are. Um, you know, I smash into the odd rock now and again, and I want to be very careful and know where they are. And if I come back, they've moved, and I got to update that model. So I got a complete 3D model of the lake bed every time I go back, and I want it local. I don't want to, if I have no net connection, I still want to be able to navigate. So, so help us understand the storage issues 
and data and disk versus uh, CF versus repetition and you know all that kind of stuff. Fortunately, all kinds of storage are getting cheaper over time, so it's a uh, it's possible uh, to store more stuff in the future. But uh, also, uh, uh, the other thing is people, uh, and especially if you're getting into the cloud, is that uh, people try to use those resources as efficiently as possible. And they're probably going to be using some types of compression. Um, a lot of things that, you, and so uh, it depends on what you want to capture, uh, depends on, uh, you know, uh, it's, um, there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of sparsity in the data you capture. Things don't, uh, both in space and time. So some things don't change. And so probably you'd be compressing that data to, in order to reduce your storage needs. But as your resolution, if your resolution frame rate or dynamic range increases, that's going to increase the size of the things you're storing. If you're trying exactly to because when I was when I was at MIT, mm -hmm. I was walking around streaming live video. This was back in the early '90s. Mm -hmm. I think I was the first person in the world to send live video, but it was only at very low res at the time. Mm -hmm. People were just amazed by even just 240 lines of resolution, but now we now people say 4K is so yesterday we got to have 8K and it's got to be 3D and it's got to be range map and it's got to be HDR lidar and you know yep. all of that. Yes. Well, back then we were using VHS tapes as well, and uh, we thought that was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> and, and that that actually brings in another aspect of all this stuff, which is um, a technical obsolescence. Uh, Oh uh, yes, how do you read some of that old data? How do you read old data? How if you record stuff over your the time the period of your life, let's say that could be a hundred years potentially, a lot of things will change in a hundred years' time. You know, well so, not just the medium, but also the format. Like exactly. I, a lot of times image old images I can't open them, so I gotta keep opening them up and resaving them because of proprietarism, shall we say. Just you know, it's it's like it's not because of any real technical challenge other than the fact that there's so many uh, non-standards that are closed and and not so open. so uh, curation uh, and ron will probably like this because he's a library guy right uh, curation is going to be uh, a big part of uh, being able to make this data available to you in the future but the thing is is that um if you had this you really could know you could uh, know your history in ways that uh you know um more than just our memories. Our memories have a certain capability, but in a sense, this gives you an augmentation of your memory of the past and understand how you've changed over the past. And maybe, you know, with those you've interacted, um, know more about them. Or let's say, uh, you know, if you included uh, uh, the storage and you also had fast processing, you could do uh, image recognition. The old line is, uh, you know, you're wearing a camera, um, you meet somebody and you instantly get information about who they are. So you never forget a name. You know, yeah, this, yeah, it's funny. That was one of the things that I, I, I demonstrated and published in 1996. The wearable face recognizer automatically connect yeah. with people. But now that we're shared, also, you know, these curated. I, I think you hit the nail right on the head with curation as a key issue uh, in storage. And that's uh, a standard. By curate? the way, that is a standards issue. Is that how do you create something where, um, and 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 a lot of this is going to be metadata, which is information about information. There's another meta yeah, term, yeah. Right? yeah, 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 yeah. And and it's going to be uh, how how can I make um, a for uh, you know define elements of the format that can be translated, even as the technology changes. So I can uh, I can uh, recreate uh, older content, uh, be able to read it and reuse it. Yeah, and yeah, metadata and and uh, well, even Hiroshi Ishii's notion of of teleabsence, like mm -hmm. like uh, there's all this data and metadata and pictures and everything. Uh, and and even as people pass on, their 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 relatives or whatever may still want to get access to that data and curate it and archive it and keep it. I don't know so how, how many how many times I've person. I've gone into you know my you know family albums and trying to figure out who some of these pictures are. You know. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't it be nice if the metadata was preserved? Because I I do notice that I can take like my Google Photos, I can save the data out, but it's really hard to save out the metadata in a structured and organized fashion. Mm -hmm. What, and that's where the machines could be, uh, you know, if uh, these machines could be very useful to help us to, you know, uh, remain more organized, uh, you know, develop, uh, you know, working together with the machines to be able to know stuff uh, and remember it later on, be reminded of things that are important to you, you know, that fit into things you want to do. And, uh, you know, uh, ideally, you know, there's challenges in doing this, but the potential benefits, and there's dangers in doing this too. And I know that Molly's been talking about a bunch of these things, 
uh, on the chat, but uh, there's also enormous opportunities, you know, ways for us to know, know more about who we are and to be, uh, I think, effectively to be more human. You yes, know, yes. Well, that whole the, metaphysical thing, you know, it's like find out who we are I, and what we are, you know. I think one reason this belongs in the IEEE rather than the ACM is sort of the IEEE's mantra of technology to advance humanity. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really core here. Yep, for the benefit of humanity, you bet. Yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. That's a great way to to sort of uh, to frame this whole thing as as is to be more human. It's funny, but by being cyborgs, we become more human. That's the possibility. I mean, there's a danger of it going the other way as we become less human. But I think it's possible yeah, for yeah. us if we do this in the right way, you know, with the right sort of ethics and approach that uh, could help us to be more be more of who we can be, you know, as humans, to be hu to be more humane, to be more understanding of each other. Um, you know, we sit, we tend to be irascible characters, but maybe we can avoid some of that and, and not destroy ourselves, you know, which may yeah. have happened to other civilizations in space. It's why we can't find any. <laughs> well, you know, just being more human in that sense of, of like, if we look on those three axes, you know, of, of, of say one uh, body ownership and control BOC, if we look at that. Uh, like one of the things about having the data yourself and curation, a lot of a lot of it is is uh, um, a lot of curation is is who owns the data, right? Like when you mm -hmm. photograph something, mm -hmm. um, again we've got body uh, ownership and control are these three axes. Who's in control of it? You know who owns that data? There's all this blockchain issues and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then is it wearable or is it remote? We can look at this again, the same taxonomy in terms of data storage. If we read off of here, do we put the data in our clothes or, or is it a smartwatch or a smartphone? Like do we wear the data or is the data on a server somewhere? Uh, and then we can say, are we in control of the data or does some company control it? Mm -hmm. And do we own our own data or is it locked into proprietary standards, you know, ownership? So we got these three axes. I think it really, would be good to look at the extendiverse as a in a BOC space and say, okay, how can we how can we understand the extendiverse in that way? Yeah, and there's a lot of public policy uh, decisions and things of that sort. You know, privacy, public policy, and, and various sorts of things um, that come into that uh, come into this as well. You know, and uh, and having standards and having an understand and creating a greater understanding of of these concepts and what they mean and what they enable or or the da potential dangers. Um, allow people, I think, to make better decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's going to be wonderful. I think that the standards are really going to be key, and this is where you, Yuan, and I are going to continue. We've been working for so many years now on this stuff, and I think we got to intensify our efforts on the standards because we do need standards for extendiverse, you know, XV standards, and even branding too. Like we've been talking about uh, uh, trying to shy away a little bit from the buzz and hype of the brand specific uh, concept of Meta, you know, even though, you know, we started a company called Meta, um, you know, we may want to, we, we may want to go to a more brand neutral um, uh, framing, like something like uh, XV, just like we did with XR, and, and instead of going with mixed reality, we migrated over to XR as a sort of framework. It does make sense to think of XV as as a sort of overarching, you know, in in this way with standards and and getting away from uh, excessive brand control. Hello. Oh, I'm still here. Yeah. Oh, uh, I <laughs> think. Uh, yeah, and and I, but you know, uh, this this idea of uh, you know capturing uh, things around you. Uh, and being able to to process that data in ways that are useful to us and access us in the future, it involves uh, you know uh, uh, developing technologies in processing and uh, networking communication and in storage and memory. Um, uh, by the yeah. way, uh, an important there, there's important aspects of uh, that are involved in storage and memory that that could be huge in terms of making things you can actually use on your body, and that is the energy consumption of these things. Um, and uh, yeah. for instance, there power uh, consumption. Yeah, power consumption, and there are 
um, uh, there's a fair amount of uh, uh, power consumption in these in 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 you know wearable devices that relates to the uh, uh, to using non volatile memories of various sorts, and so you can't really turn the power off. Uh, but there are new non new uh, sorry volatile memories, the new non volatile memories uh, that would allow retention of data within the memory even if the power is turned off. Um, that well, that's true. The more the, the the some of these newer things like like these solid state memories. Mm -hmm. uh, Gets rid of the need to have spinning platters that are not good when you're running around or swimming or whatever. Like the fact that I can have an SD card in my in my swimsuit pocket and swim to Toronto Island mm -hmm. uh, from the mainland and get there and everything's still okay, you know, versus hard drives that probably wouldn't stand the punishment of being knocked around and getting wet and yeah, uh, but I'm, I'm talking about going being, I'm talking about going beyond NAND flash. NAND flash is good for. Uh, uh, for storage, but it's actually slower, especially on writing than, than some other solid state technologies. Um, for mm -hmm. working memory in a computer, they often use DRAM and SRAM for cache, right? Um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a mobile device, um, there's people starting to use things like magnetic random access memory and resistive and various types of resistive memory as non volatile memory to replace NOR flash for code storage, but also back to as core, I guess, back to the, the old core memory that just stay like. It was beautiful. The the old data general Nova computer would be programming that thing at the end of the day, shut it off, go home, come back. The the core yes. is still there, of course. The donuts don't forget. Uh, but the other the thing is doing, and the other thing is doing computation close to where things are stored. And that because a lot of the power that's used in servers in the in the cloud, et cetera, are uh, actually uh, a lot of that power is used to move data around. So if I can do yeah, more edge computing, I guess is. Yeah, is uh, maybe XV should embrace edge computing a bit more too. Uh, yes, well, edge. Uh, there's going to be an awful lot of edge computing involved in uh, in many of these things, and which raises also uh, privacy computing uh, privacy issues. Who owns that data? Uh, you know, uh, anyway, well, not just ownership, but control. We got to think of all three. I like to think of yes. DOC body ownership control. It's uh -huh. not just who owns it, but also who controls it. Because right. a good example: imagine a police officer. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, is a burglar breaks into a police officer's home and, and say the officer, maybe she has handcuffs and a gun and mm -hmm. she points the gun at the robber and says, here, put these handcuffs on. But maybe he overpowers her and puts her own handcuffs on her. Now mm -hmm. she she owns the handcuffs uh, <laughs> and they're on her body, but she's not in control. Yes, yeah. So, so you, gotta, it, you gotta think not just ownership, but it's because you can own, you can buy a server and 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 rent based on something, but you maybe don't have control over the data. That privacy is is about all three of those things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so there's a lot of body. Uh, and if if privacy. you had access to all, if everyone was recording their lives, you had access to all that data. You would have, uh, you know, potentially, uh, you know, somebody would uh, uh, know everything about you, or yes. a lot of things about you. You know, so there's uh, there's important issues here. And ethical issues also in uh, in how we uh, you know how we do these things, which has to be tied as, into standards, I think, as well, in order to. Uh, well, make when sure. we talk about privacy, it references the body because the, the most obvious example of privacy is like when you're your bodily privacy, you know, when you take your clothes off or when you're you know, you have a medical procedure, medical privacy. Your own body is the ultimate bastion of privacy in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so then. Then you've really hit on all these three axes when you talk about privacy. Yep. If I may add, I think the X V uh as I uh thought about before, we if we put all those kind of X something together, think about them uh, together, you can find some new things that we pre previously ignored. Uh, but uh, would have some significant uh, consequences uh, on our like consciousness and humanity. So one example is about uh, like you know people. Uh, some people are talking about uh, probably we are already living in a virtual world, a virtual universe. But uh, sometimes the same same group of people they are also talking about uh, artificial intelligence, especially in terms of. Uh, if we can create consciousness by simulating human brain, so to uh, uh, in my opinion, I think those two viewpoints are conflicting with each other. So if my point is that if you are living in a virtual universe, so where is your consciousness? If you are living in a virtual universe, your conscious consciousness is unlikely in the brain of your avatar in this virtual universe, right? So 
if you are in the yeah, yeah. like you are playing a video game, then uh, if you break the uh, well, I was break down the the head of your avatar in the video game, you will find nothing to do with your consciousness. So your consciousness is probably in another universe uh, that this virtual universe is built upon, or probably there will be another soul only universe. So that's why I think we are talking about the X way. We try to uh, think about uh, the, uh, the X R, X I, and the X uh, extended beam, all those kind of things together. We may find some uh, like uh, something are inconsistent with each other, which may trigger our uh, new thoughts. And uh, so my, I myself, I'm, I tend to uh, believe that we are probably already living in a universe, virtual universe, but I would like to say that uh, before we can, uh, we will, before we will be able to create an indistinguishable virtual universe, we are not uh, really eligible to talk about if we are uh, living in a virtual universe, but that is sort of my lifetime mission. So I wanted to create a, indistinguishable virtual universe uh, to that's actually a really I, I really like the way you think of all those x's x v x r x i x d yeah. because x is really like once we switch from metaverse to x v as a way of thinking it broadens our scope because now we can ask you know the, the same way that x r extends beyond all the other realities it replaces them as special cases but it extends all you know the same way that we're we're, we're in this plane that x r over here includes all of these plus a whole lot more as well as the origin xr includes the origin which is yeah. not anticipated by these three um now the same thing here uh the extendiverse it, it includes the metaverse but also so much more and i think that uh what you're saying makes a lot of sense because we can now start to think about uh like things like like uh, smart cities where there's a a projector in every street light with the cameras that are in there and creating a, a new world or other kinds of technologies that allow us to see things that are invisible, see inside ourselves, see inside each other. And some kind of, uh, there's all kinds of unprecedented discoveries that will be made, I think, when we transition from metaverse to XV. Yeah, you know, that is sort of like a very fundamental directional problem. Because, you know, some people, we have AI uh, scientists, engineers, some of them believe that uh, they can simulate consciousness by simulating uh, every neural cells in human brain. But uh, if we are, if my point is correct, if we are already living in a virtual universe and our, our consciousness, consciousness has nothing to do with our brain in this universe, then that direction is determined to be, uh, to, uh, to, to, to fail. So actually, I'm, I'm interested. In like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in like uh, uh, how uh, Mr. Furness would feel about this because uh, you are expert of virtual uh, uh, virtual uh, worlds. So so I myself, I'm like I said, I'm a believer of uh, we are probably likely living in a virtual universe. But I wish those AI scientists to success because if they can succeed uh, by creating consciousness by uh, uh through uh well uh if they can make success in uh, uh simulating consciousness by simulating uh our brain down to every uh detail uh then that's sort of uh indirect evidence that we are like less likely living in the virtual universe but uh, i don't know so maybe uh mr furness uh, can share with us some some of your opinions in the interest of time, I think that uh, it's, uh, I don't really have a whole lot to add. Uh, I could wax poetic for hours about this, but let me just say one thing here. Um, and it's what the purpose of this meeting was all about. There are 2 things that we have to take into account. Uh, as uh, we have to understand that technology is a tool. And we can get intoxicated by that tool uh, and what it uh, can do for us. The question is, does it make it happy, make us happier? Uh, do we more, are we more fulfilled? Are we better in terms of interacting with our world and sustaining mother nature? And so, you know, it's the end we're interested in. 
but certainly the work of the IEEE is important in the means to the end. And establishing that bottom platform, as you talked about, you, uh, of the standards so that we can at least talk to each other about this. We need to have the taxonomy. I think the, the presentation of the XV is a better way to think about the quote metaverse than the way we have been doing it before. But uh, remember that it, there's what it is and what it does. What it is is something where we're trying to put some, use some tools to try to describe these technologies we're working with and bringing it together, not only the hardware, but the software, all of the other things that have to do with design of that. But what's in between all that space is where we live. And I believe that what we're on the cusp of being able to do is what I term transcendence. Transcendence is when we eventually get out of ourselves because that's the only way we can grow. Let me give you an example of that. Let's say that we are a musician and that we have perfected our ability to play a particular instrument or are in the process of perfecting. We are, quote, self-actualized. I think everyone in this room, everyone in this conference are probably there. They have their own instrument, they're self-actualized. Now, the only question that happens is how do we grow from there? This is all within us. My belief is the only way we grow is when all of us, all of the musicians come together to form a symphony. When there's a symphony, that means the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We participate in something that's bigger than we are, but we're still an essential part of it. We have to have the musicians. But when we're able to grow beyond ourselves, which happens with connectivity, with this social space that we're able to create, with all of the manifestation of it, whether it be machine-built intelligence or human-built intelligence, and combining these together, we can do that. But the end game is to preserve our civilization and our Earth. And uh, because if we don't have the Earth right now, we're not going to make it if we're killing the Earth. And so Actually, that's a very good point is that is that we need is, is sort of the importance, I guess, of 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 our, our, our place in the in the. So in it's the what world. it does. There's what it is and what it does. And we can't forget what it does because here's another thing. Physics has shown us that actually what we consider to be bits and atoms can change as a function of the way we observe them. So it's not like it's out there. It's like it's connected. Everything is connected. And so with this transcendence, we have to understand it. Really, everything's connected. And we have a stewardship over our piece of that connection and what we should do with that part of it. So that that's pretty much what I would do in putting the cap on top of all of this discussion, which has been wonderful. And I'm just still trying to get my mind around you know, I just thought the metaverse was going to be something. So I, all it is is the is the internet on steroids. You know, you connect a few more dots, and that's it. But it's not. Well, if we go, yeah, if you're, you, you know, you, if we go beyond shared virtual reality and 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 right. think of shared extended reality, I, I really like your notion of of what it is versus what it does. I think that 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 really captures uh, because it 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 goes into the 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 taxonomy as we have it is a taxonomy of math and physics and technology, but for example, the float tank uh, is a way of turning external stimulus to zero. But of course, when you're in the float tank, you hallucinate. It's almost like a lucid dreaming state, or even a television screen. You know, when it's a zero, uh, it's black. We might see it. Different humans see it differently. Or the temperature of the lake today, the lake is five degrees Celsius, and we we go for a swim. I might say it's kind of cool, not too hot, not too cold. And, you know, you might say it's really cold or different humans will perceive it differently, but it still is important to have the concept of temperature or voltage. We might have an electric shock and it hurts each different people different amount or it's not even linear. You know, you might go to 220 volts, doesn't feel like twice as much as 110 volts. Um, 
Exactly, but but so our perception is different, but we still it's still useful to make constructs where it's easy. I think it's very valuable to separate things from what's really easy to understand uh, versus what's very difficult to understand. And so we can say, okay, let's take the technology and and look at it separately in a really easy way. So sort of this blocks model that we have, we can we can try to understand simple building blocks of technology in a really simplistic way, and then. And then we can try to then build on these more uh, transcendent um, kinds of understanding of, of human issues and human factors on top of all that existing technology and our understanding of it. Okay, are we done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's been fun. Uh, uh, I, I guess we're we're probably on the right time queue. I know everything's sliding a little bit behind schedule today, but but yeah, let's get together and write. And if anyone else out there is interested in this stuff, please reach out and contact us uh, because we're writing about this right now. We're 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 writing about all these concepts at the moment, and uh, you know the sun is setting and we're thinking of the end of the day and it's a, a beautiful day, uh, but. Uh, as we as we reflect on the passage of the day, I want to kind of uh, thank everybody for for joining and and for participating, and and helping us shape this vision of the future. And I encourage others to to reach out to us and connect with us. We have the website openxv.org uh, uh, with the hope of open standards for XV. And the website is designed very simply, you know, in a 1990s style, so that it's reliable and works across all platforms and is accessible to everyone. Um, maybe that's another issue is, is fanciness versus reliability. I kind of got this almost Amish-like sensibility in website design uh, using Git, uh, GitLab. Um, and just simple things, you know, and can we keep the technology simple and reliable and can we, let, let's continue the discussion what it is that we can do to make the Extendiverse uh, a technology that serves humanity. Very good. Well, thank you so much. I assume that concludes our session today. But uh, lastly, I would like to mention that uh, uh, please stay tuned. Uh, visit uh, our website, uh, the IEEE Metaverse Congress website, which is uh, very easy to remember, metaverse.ieee.org. So uh, we will have more uh, exciting sessions in 2023. And uh, I wish all of you happy holidays. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.